Hello, everybody. Today, we are talking about is AI art unethical? If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. We actually did this stream on AI a couple months ago, and so much has happened so fast with AI in just a few months. I already feel like this video is totally out of date. Doreen, I'm curious, what have you been noticing? Because it's all over the news in various places. What's caught your attention with AI? I think it's the general impact that it's had on all of our lives and how immediate it was. And on top of that, really thinking about how it's something that we can't hide from anymore. It's here to stay. And it seems like things are happening so fast that people are writing regulations and legal stuff as things are being made. And Lauren, as an artist, I find that a little bit terrifying. Well, it's. I feel like it's similar to maybe when the internet came out where there's just a wild west. There was a wild west of the World Wide Web and now there's a wild west of AI. And I think also there might be a perception on our end as lay people talking about this, not AI machine learning designers, that it feels like it's really fast, but this is also probably the culmination or the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been going on behind the scenes to get to where we are now. And now everybody wants to be visible all at once with their new AI machine learning product. It's all happening so fast. And the thing is, when we streamed about it a couple months ago, we were talking in terms of what if, and now we're seeing the what ifs have actually happened. So people are asking these questions based on what's happened. This has been my observation. This is how we're gonna structure the dialogue today is that we have companies who are using AI to make images. And the idea is that they are not employing an artist, rather they're using AI to get the image. Now here's something which is a subset of that, which is typing an artist's name into the AI to generate images. This wasn't really happening a couple of months ago, but now it's starting to happen. And the whole concept here is that, okay, we know people are gonna do it. They, they can't help themselves, correct? And yet, do you think there's a difference between these two, Dorian, or are they all the same as a general first thought? So I think that it's definitely more impactful to type in an artist's name into the generator versus using it to just create a general image. Uh, when you think about it, generating an image is the artificial intelligence doing what it is. It's collecting all this information and making the image from whatever it thinks will look cool. It's not really expression. It's not really stealing anything or taking direct influence. It's gathering all the influences. Targeting specific artists, I think, is a little bit more detrimental. Uh, but then again, we'll talk a little bit later, I think, about how that specifically impacts artists and what level the artist might be. So we have an example here of a company, San Francisco Ballet, who for their Nutcracker campaign used the AI to make these illustrations for their marketing campaign. And Lauren, it's interesting, people were really mad at them. There was so much pushback about this. And I, I wonder if maybe that's sort of our saving grace. I don't know. <laughs> what, that people are angry and there is a yes. lot, there will be a lot of cultural pushback on it? Yes. It, it, is, it does feel somewhat egregious that a company that is within the arts would do this to artists. You would think that there is some kind of solidarity between the art forms because we all know how hard it is to get work or to survive or to be paid. 
So it hits a little bit differently. It feels more like a betrayal than, say, maybe if a soda company did their next AI campaign. Although, again, that is still taking jobs from artists. So, but I also don't know if this is going to be the only time this happens, even within the art world. I feel like this is going to, this is just the first time, you know. Tell us in the chat, do you think this was not cool for San Francisco Ballet to do this? Because I think a large part of the argument is, okay, well, they got this image. Ordinarily, they'd have to hire an artist. But there's also stuff like stock photography, but maybe the AI makes it easier. So it's like, Dorian, there's so many nuances. And so I, I just don't know. Are we just saying, oh, it's always case by case? Or can we make more broader sweeping statements? I mean, that's sort of what frustrates me. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, the best way, to, mm, this is like such a tough situation because on one hand, there's no regulation of this stuff yet. I think that's where it's the most complicated. But at what point do we, take this subjective thing and, and put limitations on it. Right. The problem though, is this is all happening and there's no regulations in place. And so nobody can point to anything. And I find that a little bit terrifying. And I just don't think the pushback is gonna be enough. I think it's like people are gonna do it anyway, even though people are upset about it. So Lauren, what do you think about this? This is Netflix has this anime that came out and they are packaging it as trying to address a labor shortage. We used image generation technology for all the background images of all the three minute video cuts because part of me sort of sympathizes when you have a big film production and things are incredibly expensive and it's hard to get projects like this off. I, I'm a little sympathetic although I understand the other way. What do you think, Lauren? That is a really hard one. I think that I would feel differently depending on the size of the film being produced and who's producing it, because say an indie film using these tools with a very shoestring budget, that makes sense. It's a tool you wouldn't hire artists extra artists anyway for it because they wouldn't you wouldn't have the money to do so so it allows more capabilities and more access maybe maybe again i'm postulating here because i don't know what this is like in the film world but it could provide more access on the other hand that's very real. Again, it's jobs. So I don't know, especially with a larger company that could afford more people. It's, uh, it's sticky. Yeah, for sure. Oh, Dorian's coming back. <laughs> He's got some Wi-Fi that's acting up a little bit. So Dorian, I think the three of us, we're artists, we're independent. We don't work for giant corporations that are just spilling out with money like Disney. Do you have sympathy for people using the AI? Because sometimes it make, makes it different. Like I can't hire Benedict Cumberbatch to be in my video. And so what happens when it, it could be almost a saving grace for a small artist working on a big project? Oh, maybe okay, Dorian's Wi-Fi died. Think that... Yeah, you're there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. No uh, problem. Yeah, it can be a saving grace. It can definitely be a saving grace, but you can only use something as a saving grace so many times before, it, as I, I said earlier, it becomes detrimental. So there has to be a way of limiting the situations and the gravity of those situations that they're used in. 
uh, like a Netflix series using it. I feel there's a lot of money behind Netflix studios now where they could actually put it towards a growing artist or someone who's trying to develop their form and actually grow with them uh, versus just kind of copping out in a sense. So question from Blue Wolf who says, will it make handmade art special and more valuable like a handmade dress customized? Well, I mean, that makes me think about the industrial revolution, you know, when people didn't have to hand sew stuff anymore and now there's sewing machines and stuff like that. And now I think we do have a certain preciousness towards things that are totally hand scratch, hand made. And so Lauren, I wonder if there might actually be the pendulum swinging in the other direction that maybe people do value the human stuff more. I think they already value the human stuff or rather I don't know where, I don't know what that pushback would look like especially like what is a handmade advertisement or what is a handmade i guess you can claim something as handmade but i, I get really weird when we start talking about like how labor is valued in the arts because i feel like there's no uh there's no actual solid monetary alignment or or value alignment with with any of of this for instance in my world in painting someone could spend 10 minutes on something and it could be sold for thousands of dollars that kind of thing whereas beginning artists will spend 90 or 100 hours and then <laughs> sell that work for 50 bucks that was also me. Let's talk about the other way people are generating images. So we looked at Netflix is using it, San Francisco Ballet, they're making images, all right? This is a different case though. This is Greg Rakowski, and he is the top used artist name on a lot of these platforms. So much so that he has these fantasy illustrations. And if we look at this quote, it says that his name has been used as a prompt at Stable Diffusion 93,000 times. And guess what? Michelangelo, Picasso don't even come close to measuring up. They're being used about 2,000 times. And this really scares me because this is somebody who's alive, like Picasso, whatever, he's fine. <laughs> he's dead. He can't do anything about it. Doesn't keep him from getting work. But Dorian, how do you feel about this artist's name being typed in that many times? Maybe our Wi-Fi hates us today. Well, the lag sucks. Yeah, it's really bad. I think Dorian froze. Whoops. It reminds me of the time that Alex was on here and Yes. Oh yeah, it went off. When Alex Maybe Dorian's was on coming here back. and respond fifteen minutes later. Yes. I can respond to this for now. Okay, you respond I... until Dorian gets back. <laughs> I mean, this feels more egregious to me and probably more egregious to a lot of people because there is a specific artist. We have a name here. It's not just a nameless person or it's not a, a rhetorical question anymore about, or a statistical question. It is, here is a person, he's seen his sales go down and his commissions go down since these things were released. And it's not just him, other pretty well-known hot, contemporary artists and illustrators have the same issue and so we can actually make come up with a measurable amount of damages here and there was a podcast episode on the journal today that was actually about him of an interview with with greg about this this issue and how much money he has lost so but I also don't know how you fight this in court necessarily, which is talking about that whole regulation thing that we're talking about. I don't know. 
how how regulation will come about for this because these kinds of fair use laws and um uh, First Amendment kinds of things are very slippery. They're very hard to to pin down or defend your case in court. Well, I always think about how Greg Kanan, who is a lawyer who has been on streams with us before, says that according to the law, you can't copyright a style. You can't say, this is my style. Nobody else can use it. That's a thing about copyright law. And yet you could say, oh, so they're just doing the same style. But the thing is, they got to the style through the artist mm -hmm. by scraping from his work. And that's the part I have trouble with. And to me, this really does feel like theft. Does this feel like theft to you, Dorian? Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yes. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it feels like theft because at the end of the day, we spend, as visual creators all alike, we spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours perfecting our craft or trying to learn what our medium is or trying to learn what our style is and to see it just kind of not dumbed down, but really just like a watered down version of it by computers. It just feels, yeah, I don't know. Blue Ren says, yes, but look at how terrible the AI version is compared <laughs> to Rakowski's actual work. And the thing is, though, so we got some back and forth in the chat, which I think is great. Ginger says, that's the thing. Most people wouldn't notice the difference. Blue says, I think people are more discerning than you think. So that's a fine line. I mean, we can't say what's easier or harder to discern between. There's nothing concrete like that. But I think... What's scary, he talks about it in this article, that the images from him that the AI made are going to populate all the images when people search, and it's going to be harder to find an original image of his work than an AI. Yeah. And that scares me. That, like, if you type in his name, that let's say 50% of them are AI, and people are going to think it's his. Like, mm -hmm. that, that would really, really upset me. Would that upset you, Lauren? This, wait, this reminds me of a story that's basically this. There was a guy that had a company that, and he sold tape, I think it was, like, adhesive. And he, or glue. And he got a lot of good reviews. He had great business. And then he realized the sales were going down and down and down and down. And then people were writing bad reviews about his products and he couldn't understand why. And then he realized that there was a company in China that basically took his his logo and everything his, and sold a product as his product, and that and it was inferior. And that's how he was getting the bad reviews. And he's also he was losing things to that person. So that kind of reminds me of that that feeling I would get see if I Google my own name and saw it. Well, here's mind. a comment from Clementine who says there's actually AI programs that have the sole purpose of removing signatures. People are sharing methods to watermark works and such to get around them. Yes. So this is an article from the New York Times talking about software. I think it's called Glaze that some of the engineers are trying to come up with. But Dorian, <laughs> this makes me angry that we have to do the work. Like the people shouldn't even be allowed to do it, and yet we're being told we have to do that. That that's sort of upsetting. Uh, this conversation is one that literally can go for hours. I really wish we had more than this <laughs> hour. Uh, I think artists are starting to realize our worth now. Also, like I think that's something that's really beautiful about this, but also really upsetting. Because, yeah, we have to do all this extra protection and all this extra stuff. But at the end of the day, when you look at these works, like someone in the chat even saying, you look at one compared to the other. And the one that you get the emotion, you get the the work that actually went into it. And you feel something more out of the one that was created by a human rather than the AI generated one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey Wright 
is pointing out AI art is still in its early stages. It's already very good and will just get better. A few more years of development, you won't be able to see the difference. I mean, look at what's just happened in a couple months. I mean, chat mm -hmm. GPT wasn't here when we did that earlier right. stream. And the speed that everything's happening, that, that's the thing is I, I feel Lauren sort of conflicted because on one hand, I'm mad. On the other hand, I'm like, dude, I got to start setting up a brick wall or something. <laughs> like if I don't do that now, I'm going to get screwed. Yeah, the chat GPT, it's funny you brought that up. I did try. I did try seeing all of the very good examples that chat GPT created. I tried to create an artist press release using chat GPT just to get started. Cause I couldn't, you, you know, it's always really hard to come up with the first three sentences. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. It was terrible. I was very disappointed. I know it will get better, but come on. It's so good at copying everything else. It could at least give me a good press release. They all sound the same in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we talked about Greg Borkowski. Okay. This is the one that put me over the edge because I confess that when we did the earlier stream, I was like, it's a tool. We'll figure it out. But then I read this article and I was like, oh my God, this is terrifying me. So this is Sarah Anderson. She's a cartoonist. And you can see on the right, and here this is her Instagram. She has a very distinctive style. You can see the style of the characters with the giant eyes. It's black and white. Even her handwriting. A lot of people don't do their own handwriting comics, but she does. And so her work is pretty recognizable. It's very distinctive. Okay. Now, when she typed herself into the generator, I mean, this is pretty close. She writes, it's not perfect, but it's captured the signature elements of my drawing style. Black bangs, striped shirt, wide eyes are immediately recognizable. And that's not it, though. What happened is the alt-right generated images with her style and put a lot of hate speech on it. And so now this is going out there in the world, not just going out there in the world, but going out there in the world showing hate speech that she has nothing to do with. Like to the point where if you read the New York Times article, she had to call her publisher and say, this is not me. I'm not the one doing this. And Lauren, th this really, really scares me. Yeah, this really goes down into that deep fake territory where you can also use different technology nowadays to create, take a video and get someone's voice and make them say something that they've never said if there's a lot of audio of them or same with their their person and that goes into areas of consent that are scary or misinformation that are scary and i have gotten tricked by deep fakes they don't have that and that technology is pretty easily available that that is also probably the scarier bit for me yeah, because the idea that, so, especially with a cartoonist, because it is such a text-driven art form, it's a little bit different when it's a fantasy illustration. But I, I don't know, Doreen, this is the thing that I'm like, oh my gosh, it, we're living in Big Brother in 1984 territory yeah. here, but worse. <laughs> it, so, okay, then can I ask you guys a question? Because I think it's interesting that there are some people that might have the viewpoint of trying to boycott places that do this. Do you think that there's a successful way of trying to not protect yourself from it, but not engage with it because it's so prevalent, so right there in your face at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of feel like she's been trapped into building a big fortress. And even the fortress isn't good enough. I mean, what she writes in this op-ed, and I really encourage everybody to read this. She writes, I found the typeface to be a convincing imitation of my handwriting. And I, I grew up where you knew where everybody's handwriting looked like. It, it was such a part of your identity. And so the fact that the text reflects that, I think is terrifying. Busy B 
says it really makes you not ever want to share your work online. I really don't know what to do. If you don't share your work, you don't get clients. If you do, you get stuff like this happening to you. Have you ever worried about that, Lauren? Yeah, I've had my stuff riff or copied and claimed by other people online before just a couple times and that it's it's a gross feeling i think people have to remember that there was issues that were kind of like this prior to these things being developed online you always have to be careful about what you put on there because it can be taken by anyone not just a robot and I think those are scary. And so there are some things out there now that are coming out that you can try to protect yourself with. As you talked about earlier, there was that glaze thing. There are ideas that people are talking about, about not using living artists, how to put limitations, how to put guardrails on these tools. But um it's just something we're going to have to wait and see for, I think, to some extent, and keep doing what we're doing to protect ourselves in the ways that we already know how. So here's a distinction that we want to be clear about. Okay, so we talked about Sarah Anderson's comics. We talked about Greg Rakowski's fantasy illustrations. Now, both of those artists are very high in terms of visibility. I mean, Greg Rakowski has done stuff for Dungeons and Dragons and all these publications. I mean, his stuff is extremely visible and Sarah Anderson as well. Now, if I type Clara Lou, <laughs> I'm not famous enough for the generator to be able to make Clara Lou style, as you can all see. But Kara Walker, who is a very high visibility artist, I mean, it knows Kara Walker pretty well. And so Dorian, I wonder what we do with this to say, okay, well, these are the artists who are already doing really well and we're not as well known. So maybe we're a little protected. I don't know. You're protected in a sense, but I think that also forms a new dialogue of what means success for an artist because Kara Walker has definitely made it, has a name. But when you look at how you said for yourself, like, I know that you're an amazing artist. I've seen your work, but other people in the world necessarily haven't. So it's like, it's kind of a, <laughs> in a sense, it makes for like a celebrity tool in a, in a weird way. Like this person has made a lot of work that's impacting the world in a different way that's like grand scale everybody recognizes it and then you have us where it's like okay i'm making this cool stuff i'm making this cool work but it's not really replicated yet well blue wolf makes a good point security through obscurity is not good in any form mm. well because i have this experience with art prof where lauren remember the olden days and we had like three people watching live and we were like oh my god three people are watching us and i just never thought we would have a substantial audience and so the way i mm -hmm. set art prof up would not be sustainable today and i realized later oh my gosh i i should have structured it so that when we do have 150,000 subs, I don't go crazy, but I didn't. And so I had to go through fixing all of that. And so Lauren, maybe you have to start digging our trenches now around the castle. Yeah, the, the thing is, is that we always forget that we live in a continuum, this constant change and what you're experiencing now or your situation now is not going to be your situation in the future especially if you're a young artist and you want to make this a career for the rest of your life you have to plan and think about what it's going to be like when you're 40 or 60. i mean don't go too crazy without your <laughs> guilt we're not overwhelmed but i think you're hitting this opacity of the future where it's sometimes especially right now where we're getting a lot of new technology at once it can be really hard to prepare for a future where we don't know what that future looks like rose candy says it sucks that people are more interested 
and looking at an AI image than what an artist made that took many hours. It's so hard to tell because we're artists and so we're seeing all the nuances, but Dorian, maybe the layperson just doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I love creating, I love making. I think that's why we're all here. That's why we all do what we do. And if someone's not able to recognize that and they want to look at a computer version, generated version, I, I happily want to accept that challenge at this point because I can't, I can't get around that AI exists anymore. Like it's making some cool stuff. It's only going to keep getting better. But I think that's going to challenge us to strengthen our craft and also find ways to be more creative in our ways of making. Clementine says, thing is, there's many AI generators. There's a generator where you can download an art style and input it in. People upload to the site like a repository. Interesting. I saw someone put in her own art. Well, Lauren, here's a very specific example. This is Rafik Anadol, and he has been very popular. One of his pieces created with AI was in MoMA. And apparently... The critics don't like him. They say that his work looks like a computer screensaver, <laughs> which is kind of true. But he's in MoMA. Who are the critics? Who are the critics, Clara? <laughs> Jerry Salt. Jerry Salt. Salt. Probably Jerry Salt. <laughs> he doesn't count. But that doesn't count. <laughs> but the thing that's interesting about this is the image created is from the collection at MoMA. It's not like the other ones where it's just like the whole world. This is from MoMA's collection and it's in MoMA. What do you think about this? I think that there is this world of data visualization in art that is extremely interesting. I kind of love stuff like this when you can curate the, the set, I guess, that you're pulling information from. I guess what I would want to know is what exactly is being pulled and how is it being used? I think the image is not actually the most interesting thing of that work. It's hearing the, the data collection that was used to create it. So when you say, oh, this is a representation of the MoMA, okay, you, you have my attention here. What is it that the MoMA is doing that can create this specific type of image that that's different than the the ai image generators that pull from the whole world i think at the same time though part of me is a little bit alarmed because in some ways by this being at moma it gives ai this street cred that almost mm. validates it that I don't know. Well, but then I'm like, but at the same time, though, art has to grow with technology. And so maybe this is an important piece because it's a slice of time and the technology that's about, I, I don't know, like, I just, I don't know, Doreen, I feel like my head is just exploding because I'm sort of mad about everything, but also don't know what to do. That's you and me both. I, I need an Advil after this. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, um, AI <laughs> is the devil. That's that's all I get. <laughs> I I love I love what it's capable of as a tool or a means of learning and teaching, but I don't like how it's approaching replacing artists because there are so many artists there like there are so many I think I get more passionate about this where I talk about POCs because people of color, minorities, uh, women, like there's so many people that aren't represented in those spaces as is and have the opportunities to share their works. And by having a computer create this piece and make it in there in the first like two years that it's there, it feels like a shot to us. And I don't know how to really process that without really just getting frustrated. Right. And we have Lisa here saying AI will remain, but we can regulate how they 
train the AI. You should not train without permission. That is stealing. I saw, mm. I forget who the CEO was. I think it was maybe Midjourney. I could be wrong. It was one of the things. And they asked him about the stealing from artists. And I could not, but his attitude was like, oh, whatever, we'll figure it out. I'm like, you can't figure it. It's happening right now. Stuff has already happened. The regulation isn't there. And I just don't believe, Lauren, that the regulation is ever going to catch up. No, well, because the technology, this is always how it is. Technology or anything, history moves faster than than the regulation. Like, regulation is reactive. Very, mm. very, very rarely proactive because humans are mostly reactive, not proactive. And then you add the government bureaucracy in there and state and... Yeah, you're not going to get another situation, but that's not just having to do with the art world. That's that's everything. I think that there is ultimately going to be regulation put in place, but how that is shaped, I think if people feel really strongly about this. They should be jumping in now and working in their own uh, capacities with their own government officials to, you know, talk about th that situation. Clara, out mm -hmm. of curiosity, who would you trust to govern this world of AI art where it's like, okay, they're in charge of making sure that our voices are heard? Like who, who will we even start to look towards for something like that? Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I suppose one thing that, I don't know if this is positive necessarily, but there's this New Yorker article who says that there's a lawyer behind a new class action suit. Every image that a generative tool produces is a quote, infringing derivative work. And so maybe it's just, we need some high profile artists who can hire these lawyers. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but wasn't there something where she went to bat for a lot of people over some copyright thing. And it's like she had the stage and the financial resources to do that. I can't do this. Yeah. But maybe Anish Kapoor could stop telling people they can't <laughs> use his color black and lead the way. Lauren, do you think maybe that'll do something? Uh, well, yes. I think that the, the burden of this should be on the artists that have the most voice. But I also think that this is a strength in numbers thing as well. Like you need someone to lead and someone who's got money. And I know artists rarely have money to lead all that and befriend people at the top or advocate at the top. But then we also have to do our part on our own level to educate and support other artists and make the right decisions and talk with the people around us so they know that this is bad stuff, you know? Yeah, and Dorian, part of me doesn't want to wait around. And that's one of the reasons we're talking about this on the yeah. live stream, because I can't pay for those lawyers. But I do think just raising awareness, just saying, hey, you guys, heads up. This is coming down the pike and help me recruit Wolverine to protect me in my fortress. We need to have something. And the twist is this article. An illustrator was banned from a Reddit forum for posting art that looked too much like an AI generated image. I mean, poor guy. Like this must just feel like crap. How do you imagine he felt Dorian? If I'm told that my art is too this is like, in a sense, calling my art mid, which is like average. And that is just like one of the biggest insults because it's, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that happened to me, I will probably just have to change my major, change my profession, think about what, what else could I be good at? Oh dear, I feel really bad for him. <laughs> Please join us, everybody, for a Discord stage session immediately after this stream. That's where you get to chat with us on voice. I have a feeling we're going to have more to chat about. This is a huge topic that we are digging into. 
We do have spaces left in our composition and thumbnails workshop, and we have registration open for these three workshops and registrations due this Friday, Art and Money, Transforming Your Art into Merch and Prints, Abstract Drawing and Painting. So these workshops are not running yet. We need to get enough registration to get them running. So get that in by this Friday. There's also a few spots left in collage and mixed media experiments. We have all kinds of services here at ArtProf, artist calls, personal art curriculums, help with your artist statements and your school applications, and portfolio critiques. Also, join our Patreon group. It's so fun. You get to come to weekly voice sessions where you can share your artwork. You can also get critiques from me. I don't critique in the public Discord channels. I'll help you boost your skills. And it's just a really nice small group of artists. We have over 11,000 people in the public channel now, which is great, but it's harder to make connections. And the Patreon group is a really good option for that. Thank you to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are loyal. Oh boy. The way so many of you have stuck with us throughout the years, I am just blown away by that. Visit artprof.org. We have lots of content on there that's not on YouTube. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.